Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank Welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. My name is Cameron Bailey. I am the artistic director and the co-head of TIFF. I'm glad to see all of you here. I think I know why you're here. We're here in conversation with Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx. Before we begin, uh, we'd like to acknowledge where we are today. We're on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat. Uh, they have been on this land and looking after it for thousands and thousands of years, and we're grateful to be in this community and sharing this land. Just one note about today, uh, in an effort to make our events more accessible at TIFF for audience members with hearing impairments, all of our in conversation with events will feature on screen open captioning of the conversation and subtitle films where possible. So one stage today, two icons. Since his debut on the acclaimed HBO epic The Wire, Michael B. Jordan has carefully selected roles, opportunities, and filmmakers uh, to make his move from a rising star to a Hollywood mogul and the cover of Time magazine. He's worked since his youth on The Wire, on Friday Night Lights, and then Fruitvale Station. He delivered the one-two punch of killer performances in Creed and Black Panther, both directed by Ryan Coogler, and he's continued to expand his roles in front of and behind the camera culminating this past year when he became the first actor producer to adopt Warner Media's inclusion writer with his film that's premiering here at the festival, Just Mercy. <laughs> Jamie Foxx has built a singular career as an actor, a producer, a comedian, and Grammy award-winning musician with countless accolades to his name. He's only the third man ever to receive two acting nominations at the Oscars in the same year for two different roles, Collateral and Ray. And for the latter, he took home the Best Actor statue in addition to a Golden Globe and a BAFTA award. We're proud to present this conversation with two iconic artists and producers about their creative process, their desire to tell inclusive stories, and their new film, Just Mercy, which premiered just last night at the festival. Now, before I bring them out on stage, we've got an exclusive sneak peek at a scene from the film. This is a scene where attorney Brian Stevenson, who's played by Michael B. Jordan, goes to Alabama to take the case of Walter McMillan, who's played by Jamie Foxx, and he's a man imprisoned and sentenced to death despite evidence that proves his innocence. Please join me in welcoming Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Foxx. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> <laughs> come on, man. Come on. Come Michael on. is wearing a nice <laughs> burgundy. Oh, man. Plush. Crushed. Oh, Ooh, that boy hot. <laughs> Go ahead. Get it out, ladies. Get it out. <laughs> Yeah. Could you just do could you just do one shot for the Instagram right here? Just work could you stay right here? <laughs> it's safe to say we had a great time oh, on set. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Gentlemen, thank you so much for doing this. Thank it's an you. honor to have you both here. Um, we want to talk about your whole career. You've made a remarkable film, Just Mercy, which just premiered, but you started way back, both of you. Thank you. People see Just Mercy yet? You see it? All right, good, good. If you haven't, you gotta check it out. Let's go way back, and Jamie, I wanna start with you. Um, take us back to Terrell, Texas, oh. young man, and mm. what first made you want to be funny? Uh, I, you know what, I, I don't know if you guys are old enough to know the Johnny Carson show. Yes. Mm. But back in the day, I was, my grandmother and grandfather, the only, television in our house was in the room that I slept. Oh, so okay. third and fourth grade, my grandma's watching the Johnny Carson show. I should be getting sleep, you know, to you know, go to school, but 
you know, the Carson show came on like 11 o'clock. Yeah, it was late. And so she said, just lay down and just, we got to watch John Carson. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, watch, I would watch the comedians come on there, mm -hmm. like Steve Allen, you know, mm -hmm. David Brenner, mm -hmm. you know, uh, David Letterman even. And I would just take those jokes from the Johnny Carson show mm -hmm. and tell them at school. Okay. And because, you know, the kids, they not up at that time, so they don't, <laughs> they don't know the jokes that I'm telling. I just, uh, you know, I stole them. But, <laughs> but uh, what would happen is, is I would be, I was very s smart. My grandmother was an educator, but sometimes I would disrupt class. So mm. um, my third grade teacher, Miss Reeves, said, listen, you're going to get in trouble out here uh, with all those jokes. But on Friday, we're in Texas, that's why the voice is <laughs> But on Friday, I'll give you five minutes Really? You know, to wow. tell. You got to do a set. Yeah, to that's do a set, awesome. you know, for the kids. So that's, you know, shout out to Miss Reeves yes. who was looking out. Oh, uh, uh, with all you the know her. What I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, did you learn to do those impressions back then as well? How did you Yeah, I would do people? impressions because it was like I was a TV kid, so I watched everything. Sammy Davis Jr. Mm. Because sometimes <laughs> we could take a sunrise. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> I just put Michael B. Jordan there. <laughs> but I would, I would, you know, just I would just watch and just imitate. And when I actually got on doing stand up uh, in, uh, in L.A., is like it's when all of those things that I would do at the at the lunch table sort of came into play. Like mm -hmm. I was in L.A. doing stand up when I first got there. Uh, like on Monday nights in L.A., it was weird. Like the little amateur nights, it was a lot of. I don't know. I don't know how familiar you are with the, with the Crips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's a it's an urban group of <laughs> young professionals. Of young professionals that are could be quite cantankerous at sometimes. <laughs> they could be a little rough around the edges. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, I went up on a Monday night, and the dude told me the Crips was here, and I didn't know. I'm from Texas. I didn't know what a Crip was. I just know they all was dressed in blue. And I thought, is this a field trip? Did you guys get a... <laughs> But I would do impersonations uh, as to make the Crips laugh as a Crip. So I would do uh, Mike Tyson as a Crip. So I'm a Crip. <laughs> Mike Tyson, how we boxing <laughs> and, and that, But at that time, I was the only black guy doing uh, Ronald Reagan. Pause. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And so, so I don't. You guys remember Ronald Reagan, right? <laughs> so I was. Well, well, is it? Well, there you go again. Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's you know it all came all came, came to play. And now I'm like doing like you know I keep working on I'm working on Dave Chappelle. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> I was incensed. <laughs> I was beside. <laughs> You could do everybody. That's called so like. talented. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Part of it. Uh, Michael, you came up a little bit differently, um, but just a lot a of bit. people. <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people would have seen you the very first season of The Wire. You were in that yeah. show. Yeah, thank you. That was that was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Very first episode directed by Clark Johnson, it by is. the way, a Canadian, Toronto boy. Yep. Clark's the guy, That's man. That's right. One of the OGs. Yeah. And you played a young drug dealer on that show. And I wonder at that age, I don't know how old you were when you were doing The Wire, but at that age, what kind of roles were being offered to you? Was it the drug dealer type or what else were you getting? Yeah, I think I was uh, <laughs> The Wire. I don't mess with this guy. Uh, I want to say I was probably, probably 14, I think, 14 on, on The Wire. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was just now starting to really get into acting, you know, really take it seriously. I just got finished doing this movie uh, called Hardball that we mm -hmm. shot in, um, in Chicago mm -hmm. <laughs> with uh, Keanu Reeves and, and, and Diane Lane. Keanu, nice. Yeah, and um, that was like my first like real big movie production. But The, the Wire for me was, um, yeah, at that time, it wasn't about really making choices mm -hmm. as an actor. You know, it's it's really like the opportunities that you get, the audition mm -hmm. that you book, you know, that's mm -hmm. the one that you did. It right. wasn't like a plethora of roles that you had a, you mm -hmm. know, a chance to choose. And 
Um, and at that point, you knew that that was what you wanted to do, or you were just trying it out? No, I was just, uh, you know, getting out of school early, going over to the city, <laughs> you know, craft services. Like, I was literally a kid that was just doing this extracurricular. It was okay. like, you know, going to basketball practice or doing something like that. It wasn't something that I thought could huh. be a career or something I could take uh, okay. really seriously. But on the wire, I was just surrounded by veterans. You know, you yeah. had, you know, Wood Harris. You know, mm -hmm. you had Idris Elba. Mm -hmm. You had Dominic West. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. had, uh, you know, um, um, uh, David Simon, Wendell Pierce. Mm -hmm. It was so many people. Andre Royo, which mm -hmm. which I credit, I think my love of acting too, mm -hmm. because um, there was a scene in, in the wire where Wallace started to you know, you know sniff coke, you know take mm -hmm. drugs or whatever, and I had you know no idea what that was. Mm -hmm. I'm a fucking kid. Me I'm like whatever. <laughs> 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 No idea. And, uh, no, I'm. I, hey guys, I'm kidding. Okay, I don't want that. I don't want that to be the narrative. Uh, no, I I want to be on record that I, I hate cocaine. <laughs> and, uh, I, I just like how it smells. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever? Anybody ever smelled it? It's great. <laughs> Yeah, that's what my mama told me. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. no so what I like, told. Ever touched it. Anyway, so it's one of those things where. Um, yeah, so 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 Andre Royal, he obviously played Bubbles on the show. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a fiend, and he was basically telling me, you know, he walked me through the process, mm -hmm. you know, of what it would be like, you know, how it would feel, you know, and then also like the the, the heroin thing, because yeah. he was he was he was big on heroin at the time, and um, and the process of like getting into character, to to feeling not like myself, like to really like you know diving into that moment, getting lost in a role, getting mm -hmm. lost in a moment, was the first time I've ever kind of like you know got lost in the character before. Mm -hmm. And I, I fell in love with that feeling okay. of like being, of not feeling like myself, of yeah. just kind of, you know, becoming who, who whoever Wallace was. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I credit the, the love of the search for that feeling of getting in other projects mm -hmm. and other roles. But as far as taking it seriously, I mean, when I got killed off the wire, I was, I mean, I thought it was over. I thought I was like, oh, I gotta go back to school and mm -hmm. like, I'll, I'll, I'll never work again. I'll never mm -hmm. see you guys again. It's all gonna be <laughs> over. And David Simon was like, nah, man, you're good. You'll be fine, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I went on to do all my children and, and, and some other stuff after that. So the wire for me was just kind of where I first got the idea that maybe this is something I could do if I took it seriously. And I, mm -hmm. and I you know, started, kept, kept, if I kept at it. Yeah. And is it true that you replaced Chadwick Boseman? Uh, oh man, that's wild. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, nah, people know about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Was you getting him back for that when you threw him off the mountain? Like, yeah. Motherfucker. <laughs> that was for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. Hey, was like, shit. Come on, man. <laughs> I gotta uh, get in the gym. I told you to get in the gym. Yeah, I did. I could have got it. I was gonna um, <laughs> no, but it, it, it was it was crazy. Yeah, he 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 played uh, Reggie Montgomery before I did at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I I was 15, 16, mm -hmm. 16, I was mm -hmm. 16. And uh yeah, that was our first interaction. It's a weird, it's, it's a weird, it's, thing. It's a weird coincidence. Yeah, and then right. we we, uh, we met up a couple times. Obviously, when we get you know when we get to Los Angeles, you're always going on the same auditions, just right. seeing each other in the waiting room, et cetera, et cetera. So it was something that we always kind of you know laughed at over the yeah. over the years. Huh. But it's crazy. It's wild. Yeah, it is. Jamie, 15 years ago, you released two movies the same year that really showed your range yeah. as a dramatic actor. Mm. Um, Ray, Taylor Hackford's movie. <laughs> Premiered at the Toronto Film Festival <laughs> and Collateral, Michael wait, wait, Mann's wait, wait. film. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I imagine you were making these back to back or very close to the same time because they came out the very same year and you were nominated the very same year. Yeah. But what was it like to shoot those two films with such different kinds of characters and different directors as well? You know what? It, it, it's interesting as a comedian. It's like um, I, I, I wanted to be Eddie Murphy. I wanted to be, you know, um, uh, the funny, uh, have the funny blockbuster, and it, and it never worked out. I would do a movie, and someone would say that looks like Martin Lawrence, mm -hmm. and it, or that looks like Eddie. It was just it, it wasn't working. So when we got into the dramatic space doing any given Sunday, mm -hmm. it, it, you know that was like sort of uh, a, a, a B, blessing. Man. Yeah, Willie B. Yeah, yeah. 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 both played football players yeah. too. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah. true. Yeah. And Texas. Yeah, Tex right. Tejas. Mm -hmm. so you know. Uh, but it was it was sort of now that we're in this dramatic space. I used to use in living color um, as yeah, thank you. I used to use in living color and the Jamie Foxx show as sort of a practice ground. Mm -hmm. Like like when you would see us working out characters on in living color, and, mm -hmm. and and you're talking about some of the most brilliant 
character actors ever. Jim Carrey, mm. uh, the Wins. I was mm. the eighth funniest person at any <laughs> given time on it. But I learned. I remember watching Jim Carrey write Pet Detective. Oh, really? Man. I remember walk in his office and he's got a cigarette. Hey man, what's going on? I said, what, <laughs> I said, what are you doing? Oh, just writing this little movie, you know, it's called Pet Detective. I said, really? I said, and he had cue cards and I was like, oh, that's crazy. So then when he finished it, he called me, hey Jamie, it's Jim, what's happening, man? I said, I'm just hanging, what's up? He said, oh, you come over, we just want to hang out. And he showed me a, a scene of Pet Detective before, you know, we, you know, we was... <laughs> We were um, sipping tea. Yeah. It's all right. You're and, in Canada. And it, but he showed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we were. So, so learn. But what we would do is watching what he did with Ped Detective. And it's interesting when you watch comedians work. They are serious about their comedic timing. So using some of those tools when we get to collateral. Having someone like Michael Mann, who you know is an incredible filmmaker, but also an incredible task master when it comes to it. He's the best person to go and gain discipline when you're trying to be an actor because mm -hmm. he doesn't let you get away with anything. Right. So I have to credit him for a, a huge amount of, of the success of Collateral because, look, it's, it's Tom Cruise uh, in it. It's, it's big. It's something mm -hmm. that I'm trying not to be in the moment of seeing Tom Cruise and you know Top Gun in the back you know it's, you know and at the same time I wanted to do my best and here's Michael Mann I'm trying to do the scene like da -da 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 -da. he says what are you doing I said I'm trying to do my thing man I got to do my thing and he says how about you don't do your thing <laughs> and I said what do you mean he says how about you're a cab driver and when's the last time you seen a cab driver do his thing mm -hmm. or is that cab driver tired from busting his hump all day no money, uh, dreaming about what his life could be. He doesn't give a fuck about who's in the back. Mm -hmm. So how about do it that way? So I credit um, him for that. And then when it came to Ray, that was a blessing from years back. That was my grandmother saying, you're gonna learn how to play the piano. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, learn to play piano. And then I went to college on a classical piano scholarship. Uh, you know what I'm saying? That was. I didn't know. I, I didn't know she was giving me the tools. She said, like, "You're going to be able to." She used to say, "Play this piano because you're going to be able to play on the other side of the tracks." Mm. And you know, I'm live, I'm in Texas, so I was thinking. She, I said, "You mean to play for white people?" Mm. She said, "No, silly. I want you to play for people all over the world. The metaphoric tracks." Yeah. So, here, here we are, Ray Charles Taylor Hackford, and we're talking about playing this iconic character. And Taylor goes, "Well." Uh, I have a problem. Uh, you know, I, I can't shoot you in the frame like this because I'm going to need someone to play the piano hmm. uh, and I got to go from the hand. So I say, hey, man, we're in luck. Grandma ta taught me that. Mm -hmm. so, so we good. And then it was a matter of meeting Ray Charles. And when I meet Mr. Charles, um, I was like, Mr. Charles, I, you know, I just, I just want to do the best I can uh, playing you. He goes, hey, you know what? Can you play the blues? <laughs> I was like, what? Hey, hey, can you play the blues, man? If you could play the blues, baby, you could do anything. <laughs> so we sat down on p dual pianos at oh, his studio wow. and started playing the blues, wow, right? Wow, that's crazy. And then the next thing you know, he moves into like the loneliest monk. And anybody who plays mm -hmm. knows that that's, that's treacherous, you know, trying to follow him. And then I hit a wrong note. He said, hey, hey, what the hell was that? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to catch that. Hey, hit the right note, man. It, it, you know, these ears, man, it's sensitive, man. That sounds like shit to me. And, and, I, and I was like, yeah. He said, and then he said this. He says, hey, you know what? That's what life is about, man, hitting the right notes. Take your time to find the right notes. So the next thing you know, we're playing. I hit the right notes. He says, hey, you know what? Kids got it. And he walked off. And that, and that was, was a journey. And that was a journey of, of, of Ray Charles. And then... The last part of it is, was that that was the old Ray Charles. I needed the young Ray Charles. Mm -hmm. So I had to ask people about him. So I went to Quincy Jones and I said, tell me about Ray Charles. Oh, yeah, shit, man. Ray's, Ray, he's, a, he's an incredible man. Shit, he's a son of a bitch. Man. He's, <laughs> you know, he knows the music, man. I said, well, I need to know the young. He says, well, let me try to find something, man, so you could you know, try to get the voice, man. And he gives me a cassette tape. And I said, what's this? I said, Maybe there's something on there you could take, you know, and listen. I said, okay, I gotta find a car that has a cassette player. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I went to Hertz Rent a Car, right? <laughs> or some, I'm, I don't wanna endure, I don't know if that was really, I don't wanna, it was a rent a car place. Right. 
And I popped the cassette tape in, <laughs> and there's the young Ray Charles on the Dinah Shore show. Wow. And so I popped it in, and you hear, hi, this is Dinah Shore from the Dinah Shore show with two very wonderful musicians here today, Mr. Kenny Rogers and Mr. <laughs> Ray Charles. And in the back, you hear Ray go, hey, you know what? I'm so happy to be here uh, at Dinah. And thank you so much. I didn't know that you, you, you really loved my music. This is just a, uh -huh. And I was like, wow, that's, that's the yeah. ingredients to really bring the youth in. Mm -hmm. And then at one point, she goes, talk about the drugs, Ray. And there's silence for about five seconds. Awesome. And he started to stutter. Hey, well, you know, uh, and so I used that DNA for the character mm -hmm. that when Ray was talking about his music, he was in control. But when he was in breach of someone's emotions or had done someone wrong, I would make him stutter. stutter so, yeah, yeah, that was it. That's beautiful. Yeah. We've got. Thank you. I love listening. We have. Music. Yeah. It's an amazing story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of clips from Collateral and Ray. We want to play, and then we'll oh, come back. So I could have just, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, Michael, your defining moment, at least in, in my view, came a little bit later, 2013, 2013 to 2015, with the release of Fruitvale Station and then Creed. <clears throat> One of them was an independent film, um, part of, and the other uh, part of a legendary franchise, the Rocky franchise. Both of them directed, though, by Ryan Coogler. Yes. And suddenly there's this kind of new complex black male heroism that is represented by your performances on screen. Um, what was the intention behind those two roles? Because at this point you've left the wire behind, you've left the TV shows behind, and you have a little bit more agency perhaps in mm -hmm. what roles you can create. So what was behind th those decisions? I think uh, I was coming off of uh, sh shooting this movie called Chronicle. I yeah. shot that in, uh, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and it was right around the time Trayvon Martin had just got shot uh, in, in, in Florida. And I remember being extremely like just bothered and upset, man. I, I didn't really have an outlet to really express myself. At the time, I remember calling up my agents being like, man, I want um, I want a gritty independent, you know? I want a gritty independent fi film to just show that I can, I can carry a film. You know, I, I never, I've been a part of ensemble, ensemble cast and television mm -hmm. shows, but I never, you know, I wanted to see if I had what it takes to, to be a leading man. Like I knew like, you know, I just needed the material. I never mm -hmm. had I never had the opportunity to do that. And um and that was a, that was a that was a, a secondary conversation that was, you know, happening at the same time as all this was going down in Florida. And when I got back to to LA, out of just pure chance, Ryan Coogler was reaching out to uh, an assistant at, that worked at my at, at the, the agency that I was at at the time to try to get me the script. Mm -hmm. um, and the assistant talked to another assistant, got to my agent, mm -hmm. the script got got there, and and I and I read it when I got back, and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I was like praying for, exactly what I was looking for. It was the perfect combination of you know professional, you know, opportunity for mm -hmm. me to, um, to carry a film, but then also it, it allowed me to say exactly what I was feeling, you mm -hmm. know, um, to actually say something with my work. Yeah. Um, and I sat down with Ryan, and within five, five minutes of, of uh, talking with him, I was like, all right, let's go do it. You know, mm -hmm. like it, it, it was, uh, he's that type of person. He's yeah. that, that type of leader. You know, if you, if you ever had a chance to hear him speak or talk or, 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 um, or talk with him, you understand what type of person he is. He's unapologetically, who, you know, who he is. Mm -hmm. You know, he's from the Bay. You know, he's uh, he, uh, you know, he, he's, he has that pride. You know, mm -hmm. what I'm saying that that Bay Area pride. Mm -hmm. um, extremely smart. You know, um, a student of, of film, and uh, and I just trusted him. You know, like if, if we had you know grown up in, in New York, New Jersey together, he would have been one of my closest friends. Yeah. You know, we spoke the same language, and I never had a director like that. Mm -hmm. I never worked with somebody who n knew who knew me so well. Mm -hmm. So he uh, he told me later on in, in the process that he wrote it specifically for me, oh, um, mm -hmm. which which was, uh, you know, another, you know, first time I never had somebody yeah. write some, you know, something for me, which was a, which was an incredible honor. But uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, take, taking that, taking that project on mm -hmm. was, was, uh, was a challenge because, you know, Oscar wasn't around, you know, he yeah. lost his life. I didn't That's have right. anybody yeah. to, uh, to really talk to, um, you know, I, I couldn't pull from him, so mm -hmm. I had to get to know him like like Jamie did with the people that knew him the best. Right. You know, I had to go spend time with his mom, yeah. you know, with his best friends, with his daughter, uh, you know, with his, um, you know, with the, with the, the mother of, of, of his daughter as well. So it was it was a that was the first time I actually had to do the homework, really do the homework, really live that life, and 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 try to become uh, 
somebody else or get that the essence of, of who he, of who he was. Um, so that was, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, we've yeah, got a that. clip yeah, from Fruitvale Station let's and one from Creed as well. And there, there's a leap between those two movies that we can talk about, yep, too. let's do it. All right, let's look at those two films. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that scene. Yeah. That was a lot favorite. of fun, man. Those chickens are a problem. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. You're going to get like four really good takes and then they're uh -huh. tired. It's really, really, actually really easy to pick up after a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those first initial takes, it was a lot of fun doing that scene. Man. That was crazy. That's fantastic. Um, My... Um, my son's seen Creed several times, and Creed 2, he's 10 years old, absolutely loves that movie, and I think there's a whole lot of people, boys, girls, young people, old people, who see themselves in a lot of what both of you have been doing on screen, and it makes a huge difference. Um, I wanna ask you a little bit about, because that's a tough physical role, and Jamie, you've done a lot of physical transformations in, in your work as well, Ray especially, but others as well. Acting is so many things, but part of it is just transforming yourself physically, whether it's to play a boxer uh, or an athlete of some other kind or to play Ray Charles. Can you talk a little bit about what it takes, what kind of discipline and what kind of uh, training you have to do to, for the physical part of it? Uh, yeah, Creed was the first time I actually like, I had to change my body and I, I was, yeah, I was really looking forward to it, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Wait, so y'all gonna pay me money yeah. to get in the best shape of my yeah, life. Yeah. This is awesome. I got abs and shit. This is new. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. amazing. Uh, There's um, a few people out there who look, looking, forward, looking forward to you getting in shape as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it was a good time. Honestly, I, I had... Um, I had met this trainer, uh, Corey Callier, uh, when I was shooting Fantastic Four down in Louisiana. He's oh, yeah. from Louisiana, and I met him. And we just clicked, man. We had a brotherhood as well. Just like God's been placing these people in my life, you know, that I've been, I had a, you know, been fortunate enough to meet, you know, along the way that's been crucial to like my success and to my, to mm -hmm. my process. So, mm -hmm. you know, I thank God for that brother. But I had met him down there and we, and we, and we, uh, we connected. And I just brought him on, I brought him to Los Angeles, you know, I moved him out there and, and we were getting ready for this role. And it's the diet, man, honestly, mm -hmm. the diet, the, um, yeah, the carbs, right? No <laughs> carbs, anything that tastes good, just throw it out. I mean, yeah. like between like bread, sugar, you know, the yeah. dairy, those are like, when you cut those out and you mm -hmm. work out consistently and you drink a lot of water, you'll see yeah. your body change. Mm -hmm. And like, and that was like the regimen, you know, six mm -hmm. times, six, six days a week, you know, some two, two times a day, wow. sometimes three times a day, yeah. really like putting the work in. But the crazy thing about Creed was we were shooting, we, me and Ryan didn't even shoot one frame of Fruitville Station when he pitched to me Creed. Really? He basically was like, yo, I've got this idea about, you know, Apollo Kids, you know, um, Apollo, at the time it was Apollo, Kid, Apollo Creed's grandson. grandson. Oh, That's okay. what it was. And I was like, I was like, yeah, sure, let's do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was running back and forth to MGM, pitching to, you know, to Sly, mm -hmm. to Erwin Winkler, to everybody over there, and Gary Barber at the time over at MGM. And, uh, and yeah, that, that's how that project all came about. So I had about a year and a half to get in shape. So okay. I was secretly getting in shape for this movie before mm. it was even greenlit. Really? So that's how that's how that first one kind of went down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but talk about because you to me like in Creed, you actually went to me. You went up a notch, mm -hmm. and to me, it was like you know it it it, it went brilliantly. I think with the character, how much more. How much more did you have to work out for the new, like the new? What, Creed um, 2? Yeah, Creed 2, mm -hmm. the new, sort of the new body. Because, I mean, I remember watching, I was, I don't know how, I, I, was, I was just going through my phone and I saw the trailer. I don't know how I got on there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but literally, like, all the guys that hate you already were looking <laughs> like, man, let me see that shit. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> We were all just like collectively going, fuck, and passing around, fuck, fuck, man, fuck that, fuck that but, but there was those iconic shots, man, but, but how, talk about that process. I mean, it was, I, I, wanted, I wanted to be the best, you know, you, yeah. you saw, you know, Sly and, you know, and uh, Carl Weathers yeah, back in the day, you know, yeah. and, and they were, I was just looking at them like, man, that's incredible, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of baby oil, I feel you, but <laughs> that, I want, I want that. I want my version you know, of whatever that, that right? was. Oh, and um, yeah, and me, and me and Corey went out. We just went out to kind of to to, yeah. to to level up. We just want to do our version right. of what that was. And you know, if you're stepping in the legacy of what Rocky was, you know, and trying to create your own mm. thing, you you gotta you gotta come correct. Yeah. So that was kind of like the the motivation behind it. But then also, it was a. Uh, your body matures. You know, at that mm. time I was like 24. Shut up. I was like, I was like 24, 
24 to 25. And that was the first time I changed my body. So yeah. it, it was like the first time my muscles ever had a chance to mature like that. Right. So when we, when we got a chance to do it again on Creed 2 or even Black Panther, yeah. it was, uh, it was uh, my body responded a lot quicker. Like yeah. the muscle memory came back yeah. and it just, you know, we didn't know yeah. I was gonna end up looking like. Yeah, you sure did. See, <laughs> see, 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 Mike, you, you got something to look forward to. The body doesn't respond like that <laughs> <laughs> ever again. Yeah. And you know what's fucked up? It's like when you get older, like, yeah. you know, over 50, oh, you said. clap No, 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 you over 50. <laughs> like, like, I have to change, I had to go to the bands and shit. Like, because you know, I, I went to the gym and I was, I'm gonna get my old man bench press on, you know, and I get my swole. But when you get older, you can't hold your swole like you used to. <laughs> I come out the gym with my swole and then as I'm walking to my car here, <laughs> <laughs> And then you know how you see your reflection in the car? I'm like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> I was in there for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so all you old motherfuckers, let it go. Yeah. Get your long shirt. <laughs> Much carbs as you want. All right, let's move on now to heroes, anti-heroes that you both played. I want to talk about two movies. We've got a clip actually as well, but I want to talk about Django Unchained. Mm -hmm. Quentin Tarantino's movie, you play the hero, riding on a horse, and I want to talk. Go horses, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to talk about Black Panther. Um, why don't we look at the two clips we have, and we'll come back and talk. Cool. <laughs> 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 that scene. <laughs> People play over and over again. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. I mean, both of those characters became iconic. And for reasons, I think. They, because they, they, they said something that maybe we wanted to hear or see. We didn't see often enough in movies. I want to start with you, Jamie. First of all, working with Quentin Tarantino, what was that like? And playing a Western hero in the era of slavery as well. He's incredible. Like, I'll literally say that he's probably the best director out there because of what he does mm -hmm. and how he does it. Um, when I went to, now listen, everybody, I didn't know about the uh, uh, Django at first. I had, my management at the time was, you know, it was, you know, they wasn't really, I had to, I had to get new management. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, because That's I had been hearing, I had been hearing about the, uh, had been hearing about, about the, the character and I heard that, uh, Will, you know, Will Smith, Mm -hmm. was was going to play it. and I was like I, I was like will if you if you play it, it'll be you won't be able to walk the planet earth mm -hmm. uh, and he he just he decided not to and then it was uh <laughs> and then it was uh and then it was Idris Elba at one point and he and I ran into him he said you heard about this Quentin Tarantino movie <laughs> it's all about Django you know <laughs> Certain scenes, you're feeling on me balls and that in there. I was, like, I was like, I don't give a fuck. Joe, beautiful black ass, ride up on that horse. It's gonna be, it's gonna be problems for everybody. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know what I'm saying? But then he didn't want it as well. <laughs> so when I finally get a chance with my new management mm -hmm. to go in and meet with Quentin Tarantino, I already understood what Django was. Mm -hmm. And when you read the script in Django, a lot of people had a, a, a hard time with the N-word mm -hmm. because it was said a hundred times. I said, mm -hmm. but I understand it. Me being from Texas, coming from a Southern place, it wasn't, as, it wasn't as heightened as you guys listened to it. It was sort of like just another Tuesday. And mm -hmm. uh, I had already learned the text and everything. I performed it in front of him. But here's here's what I think won him over. Uh, I had my own horse. I said, by the way, I know you're looking for the time. <laughs> I said, I got my own motherfucking horse outside. <laughs> and he goes, you have your own fucking horse? <laughs> Are you fucking serious? <laughs> you have your own horse? <laughs> And we started working together, and it was amazing to 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 work with Christoph, to work with Samuel Jackson, Leonardo DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio. It was it was like going to work on an all star team. Uh, Christoph, who was absolutely amazing, uh, won the Oscar. Um, but then we were working, and then Samuel Jackson and and. Leonardo walking, it's like they were walking in slow motion when they walked on, they had, <laughs> had their vapes and shit, and <laughs> and shit. But when I say people were 
absolutely amazing. But what was great about Django was that Quentin Tarantino wanted that black man to win. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that you don't see in Hollywood. He won, as a matter of fact, he blew the house up mm -hmm. and he goes, my ending doesn't work. And this is what makes him brilliant. He's standing on the rubble while it's burning. He says, everybody go home. I'm gonna rewrite the ending of the movie in my trailer. And he went in his trailer freehanded, rewrote the ending and gave it to us. Wow. And uh, the ending that you saw, which is absolutely a, a, a amazing. So it was just a, um, it was a brilliant, uh, brilliant experience. And, and like I said, that character to this day um, is, 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 is legendary. And my, and my horse um, <laughs> did my, the reason that he liked the horse, because it looked exactly like the stunt horse. Uh -huh. All I had to do was paint the, paint mm -hmm. the feet uh, white. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and she's, she's actually in my backyard right now, cheating. <laughs> That's amazing. You got a horse. Yeah, oh, cool, got a cool, horse. Cool. Yeah. I didn't know. I, I couldn't yeah. tell. You thought I was joking? Yeah. I mean, no, no, I was like, no, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. You, you don't have a horse? I don't have a horse. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, and my, I just got a house. Like, yeah, yeah, no horse. <laughs> and no, but, but she, she's, she's at my house. And uh, wow. even when we were shooting, my, my horse is a black horse. She's a, she's a black horse in her mind because, <laughs> because when we were shooting, you know, they had the big scrims, um, you know, and she wasn't used to that. She was like, what is all this? <laughs> And then the dude grabbed her by her mouth, and I said, "Don't grab her a bit, cause don't, don't. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> Tell her motherfucker, don't touch my mouth no more." <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. Um, All right um, I can't follow him. No, uh, yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> no, 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 no. Django became an iconic <laughs> character, but so is so is Eric Killmonger. <laughs> Not. Hey. I mean. <laughs> Not actually the hero of Black Panther, but a lot of people really took him as the hero. Well, I want to know, what did that character mean to you? What does he represent? Oh, uh, man, I think he, he, he represents, you know, African-American, you know, black diaspora. You know what I'm saying? That's just, that's what, that's what, that's what mm. he, he was. He was the, you know, the, the other half of the conversation, mm. you know? I feel like the, the... The conversation between the the the, the propaganda, the, the 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 brainwashing that we have that that separates us from our motherland, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that you know Africans and African Americans aren't the same, that we're not that we're not yeah. that we're not as close. Mm -hmm. This was the the bridge of com this is the bridge to that conversation. Mm -hmm. I felt like that you haven't seen those two um, two sides of an argument in, between T'Challa and Killmonger on screen before. We haven't seen that mm -hmm. amongst our community. So I think it was really important to kind of get that conversation started. Get yeah. that, get that, that, get that going between mm -hmm. uh, that you are my brother, you are my sister, we're, we're here. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It's not like, oh, you guys are not really African because you're African American. Right. That whole thing, shut that shit down. Yeah. That, that, that was a part of that, mm -hmm. that, that, that's what went into uh, Killmonger. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, he was angry, he was alone. Eric, you know, didn't have all the luxuries of, of growing up in royalty and knowing about where he comes from and knowing mm -hmm. about his history and knowing about his culture and, and not having that, he was lost. He didn't know where he, what mm -hmm. he, he, didn't, he felt like he was a part of the lost tribe. Right. You know yeah, what I'm saying? He considered, he considered African Americans the lost tribe. And, um, and, it, and, and it, would, it felt good to get that frustration of all the things that we're going through here in America. You know, it felt good to get that out on character, you know, on screen, unapologetically, yeah. you know, in, in, a, in a real way. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it, was, it was really liberating for me. It felt good. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Um, we want to go to uh, Just Mercy now. We've got one uh, last clip from the film uh, that I want to show, and then we can talk a little bit about how that film came together, because it's an important project for both of you. Let's look at that clip from Just Mercy. Incredible work from both of you. The two of you have made a lot of movies and TV that have entertained us for years and years, but this film is more than just entertainment. There's something that you are trying to accomplish with making uh, Just Mercy, and it's also uh, partly from your production company, Outlier Society. Can you talk a little bit about what you want this movie to achieve, uh, each of you? Man, this movie means so much. Um, Brian Stevenson means so much. Uh, he is an incredible human being. He's a real life superhero, um, and it was an honor to kind of, you know, to, to tell this story. I think so many themes in this film, but I want people to watch this movie and feel like they can be a part of the change. I think criminal justice and and, and the corruption 
within the judicial system is seems so large and so big that individual people don't feel like they can do anything to really to contribute to do anything yeah. to be a part of that movement but i i'm here to tell you that it 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 matters mm -hmm. you know it really does each person it it matters that you get involved that you feel something uh karen one the uh, who uh plays um uh mindy uh many uh walter's wife in in the um in, in the movie I uh, said something the other day, it's like, find your something. Mm -hmm. You know, find your something that speaks to you. Find your thing that you want to get out and, and actually be a part of that change. Yeah. Contribute, do whatever mm -hmm. you can do. He's talking about, you know, emotional currency. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what can you, how can you, how can you deposit that back into this movement? You know, that, mm -hmm. that's what I want people to ultimately take away from this film, mm -hmm. amongst a million other themes that we have in this, in this, uh, in this, in this movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jamie, you're playing the character who's uh, unfairly accused mm -hmm. and convicted mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. on death row awaiting a death sentence. Yeah. What do you want to get out of that portrayal in this film? I, I just think that it's, first of all, this young man, um, Fruitville Station, I tell them this all the time, the fact that you did Fruitville Station and you laid down these artistic railroad tracks that can always give us these types of movie. I, and I don't know if it was by design, but even when you play Killmonger, you still bring that integrity and make us all feel great. And what's great about when you do these roles, um, everybody is on board, which is amazing because this movie tested uh, at 97 in front of an all black audience. And we were so happy and pleased. And then they said, well, we tested it in front of an all white audience. And you know, immediately you're like, oh, you're waiting, like, oh. And it tested that as 98. So kudos to, to what you did and continue to do. And I'm humbled that, that, that you allow me to take on the Walter McMillan character because I always say this, I'm just born. I, can, I could not help the way I came out. There's no one, no way anyone in the world could help the way you come out. When you're born and all of a sudden you see someone who hates you because you were just born, it throws you, especially for intellect. I'm not some, I'm not a, I'm not simple-minded. I'm complex, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that way. So when I saw these things growing up in Texas and, you know, um, um, uh, the N-word being hurled so mm -hmm. matter-of-factly, mm -hmm. I understood what Walter McMillan was going through when, uh, even now in 2019, if I'm driving my nice car in my nice neighborhood, almost feeling like I'm white because I was, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. driving my Rolls Royce feeling a certain way, but that cop get behind, I know what the hairs on my yeah. back come up, man, yeah. not demonizing all cops, but it's a real thing for us. Yeah. So in this movie, I wanted to take you into what Ma Walter McMillan is. He's, we as black people, we got two sides of us every day. When I'm at the crib, I can be my own thing, but when I walk out into the world, there's certain things that I can and can't say. I don't wanna offend, I don't, wanna, I don't want y'all thinking I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the, you know, the, the perception of me, you know? And so, and it's an interesting thing, um, uh, the perception of Walter McMillan is what got him. Along with the sinister mm -hmm. uh, undercurrent of what racism could do to just take a man out of his car and say, you killed somebody to a place that he had never been. And all of a sudden, the, the rarity of being born, of how special it is just to be born, and all of a sudden, you get your shot at life, and now this happens. So I wanted, we wanted to make sure people understand um, how tragic it is and how commonplace it is. It happens all the time. And, and we here's what I hope we do. Just don't become so used to it. It's a weird thing being black. Like, we go to jail so much till we start rapping about it. Fuck it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It becomes a badge of honor for us because we don't even know how to, we don't know how to come together and try to fix it. The narrative that's been heaped on us so much, we just sort of go with it. So with this movie that you're doing, young man, and, and when you see Walter and, and you see this um, uh, amazing grace of Brian Stevenson, anybody that's seen it, you know, you, you get touched by it. So that's the first step of getting things changed is you get touched by it and then you go out and then, um, you know, you speak about it, you know, especially when, you, when you're not black. I mean, it, I, I had a conversation with a very well-to-do white director one day, and we were talking about Trayvon Martin, and he has a young black son. And I said, you know, hmm. 
I said, you know, uh, um, um, uh, a million, a billion black people yelling to the top of their lungs that there's racial injustice. The needle moves. But one influential white person, white man especially, say, hey, this is wrong. The needle does that. So our hopes is, is that we all become part of this wonderful narrative and try to try to change things so we can get better. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Very well said. Man. All right, we have a few minutes left, just a few minutes. If you uh, don't mind, I'd love to just raise the lights a little bit and maybe we can take one or two questions. And we're going to ask you to bring your best questions, <laughs> okay? So uh, let me see, uh, I think, do we have microphones? On either side of the room, okay. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, this person right oh, over Pat. here. That's crazy, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. well, I didn't the top. Uh, yeah, right here. Um, is there a microphone right here? Oh, no, actually, I meant back here. No, 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 I, um, <laughs> after the break, gentleman who has people pointing at him, up. that's the one. Sorry about that. I know a lot of people have questions, but we only have time for a couple. Go ahead. Um, so, you're, Jamie, you're really good at accents from what we all saw. Um, could you do your best Sylvester Stallone one? You know, you know, I don't know. I don't know, you know, it was crazy. I am. <laughs> All right. And then a, pretty, pretty, okay, pretty we're going to move on. Thank you. Okay. Damn it, uh, Rock. Who do we have over here? Damn it, Rock. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, no, just behind. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, microphone's on its way. Hey, what's, what's uh, up? It's a microphone right, right behind you. Go ahead. <laughs> what is that? Um, it's a pleasure to just be here. I uh, just want to ask if you find that there's... If, if there is a higher frequency in representation in terms of black uh, actors and actresses um, being represented ultimately in Hollywood. You mean, oh, what's the question? Oh, what's like, it? are you seeing a higher frequency? Are you seeing like things are moving in a better direction? Yeah, you know, I, feel, currently? I, feel, I feel like, um, I feel like the industry is very overreactive. You know, they, they, they overreact, you know what I'm saying? It's a very reactive place. Um, I feel like movies, uh, successful films, you know, like you know, Black Panther really uh, helps move that needle. It may not be right, it might be, it may not be immediate, but it's creating a new ambition, you know, from from <clears throat> people, from actors in front of the screen to directors to writers to uh, you know, costume designers to you know, pr uh, production designers. It's uh, fields that they never thought, options they never thought was possible. They feel like that that could be for them now, and I feel like. Once you see the generation of kids, you know what I'm saying, that start to aspire to be and intentionally study, and then once they start to grow, you're going to start to see more of a, a, a landscape change. But right now, you're seeing little, you know, drops in the buckets here and there. But we're, we're taking steps in the right direction. But I think it's just going to take time for like new crops to come in. And uh, and because like right now, you know, it's tough because, you know, I'm casting the film um, right now, and um, we, we shoot in, we shoot in Germany, and the process to you know, department heads, you know, when you, you go past three or four, you know, the top, you know, in their field, then it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge gap, you know, and, and, and those three or four are working consistently, you know, so it's like, it, it, it sometimes it's a, it's a lack of, um, it's a lack, it, of, a, a it's lack, a lack of, of opportunity, but it's been that way for such a long time mm -hmm. that we're, we're making up, we're trying to make up for lost, the, the demand is so dire right now, but we have, we don't have, the infrastructure hasn't been there. So now it's all about building on that over time, and we're just trying to do our part to lay down that foundation. So, you know, when when the people are ready, it'll be there waiting for them. Mm -hmm. Talk talk about what you did in this film, though the inclusion. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the inclusion writer is something I, I uh, heard Francis McDormand say at the Oscars, you know, a few years back, and I was sitting in the crowd. And I was like, oh man, damn, okay, there's something that we can do like that. It's like it's a it's an actual formal thing, you know, in writing and. Um, and as a person of color, I was gonna do that anyway, my production mm -hmm. company. It was like I was gonna, you know, that's just what the natural, you know, thing I wanted to do. But uh, the fact that, you know, I can make that a company mandate at Outlier Society, um, having amazing partners in Warner Brothers that uh, you know, collaborated with my production company 
to 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 help write their policy for all of Warner Media, you know. So so and that's a huge step, you know, on, on how they hire. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the hope is that that's going to set a precedent, you know, that's going to actually in, in, you know, inspire other production companies, other studios to follow their lead. You know, you have arguably the biggest studio in the world taking this, taking this leap, getting behind this, this message, getting behind this, this, uh, this movement. You know, uh, like I said, it's very reactive. It's like, oh, that's safe. Okay, cool. I'm gonna go ahead and do that too. So hopefully, that's gonna inspire you know other um, you know systems and other infrastructures to do the same thing. And you know, like I said, it's a step. You know, we have a lot of steps. You know, we have a long way to go, but it's a step in the right direction. I feel like. Thank you so much. We are out of time. I just want to thank you both mm -hmm. for all the work that you've done. Appreciate Incredible it. talent. Thank you. thank you. And for taking the time today. Wow, thank you so much. I'm not thank you. Appreciate it. Bro. All right. Thank, thank you guys. You. Thank thank you. You. Okay. Jamie Foxx, Michael B. Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.